Hello, Dr. Debbie Morris here today um, in our neurology course. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about several disorders that we would call neuromuscular disorders that involve uh, pathology of the nervous system that affects our motor function. The topics that we're going to cover today include multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, very different disorders, ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, something called restless leg syndrome, myasthenia gravis, and Lambert-Eaton syndrome. And I want to start with multiple sclerosis. This is a significant disease that is a demyelinating disease. It is the most common order, a disorder of, um, de that involves demyelination or loss of myelin from um, heavily myelinated axons. And it is an autoimmune disease, a chronic and usually progressive disease of the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord. In most cases, um, it is progressive to disability, although not everybody with MS ends up with significant disability. However, within about 15 years after diagnosis, about half of the folks who are diagnosed with MS need at least some walking aid, a um, stick or a walker, uh, in order to be able to maintain stability and walk uh, safely. In, um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the different uh, ways in which multiple sclerosis presents and progresses. But I think the thing that is most important to understand about MS and to maintain your index of suspicion when you see symptoms um, to think about MS is that in MS is in many ways defined by having symptoms and lesions that would be seen on imaging studies that are separated in space and in time. So people will demonstrate uh, motor symptoms and sensory symptoms. They will have more than one um, episode in terms of imaging or at least more than one symptom. And in terms of imaging, the uh, areas of demyelination will be separated in space involving uh, central nervous system white matter, whether in the brain or in the spinal cord. So uh, two or more different regions involve uh, at least a couple of episodes um, in order to make a definitive diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. This is, as I said, a chronic autoimmune disease in which myelin is attacked by uh, immune cells, leading to loss of myelin on heavily myelinated axons, leading to axonal dysfunction, slowing of uh, the transmission of um, electrical signals, um, and in some cases, loss of the axons eventually uh, and, and neuronal loss. The, again, we have a good um, osmosis video that I would strongly recommend that you watch. We don't entirely understand what causes MS. Knowing that it's an autoimmune disorder is a progress over what we knew. 20 or 25 years ago, we do know that it is more common at higher latitudes. So people who live in the north in the northern hemisphere and in the south in the southern hemisphere um, are more likely to have MS. And, and this map demonstrates uh, prevalence of MS in different latitudes. It 
usually presents in young adulthood, occasionally in adolescence, um, more in women than in men. So there's about a two to one um, preponderance of females over males in terms of the diagnosis of MS. It is more common in white people than in black people. And in most cases, the symptoms start in the 20s and 30s, um, almost always before 60. And there are about 300 cases a year in the United, or I apologize, there are about 300,000 cases in the United States. So um, it has been associated with uh, lower vitamin D levels, whether that is because of decreased sun exposure in those northern latitudes and whether it is a correlation or somehow causative is not known. There are definitely some genetic factors, uh, but they have not been identified. There seems to be a correlation between Epstein-Barr virus, which as you know is a herpes virus, and the development of multiple sclerosis. But again, we don't know if that's causative. We have a lot left to learn about the um, causes, the etiology of multiple sclerosis. Although we know, again, as I said, more about the pathophysiology than we used to know that involves cellular immunity. In terms of pathology, we in MS, we see inflammation around uh, of white matter, typically surrounding vessels, and ultimately demyelination. The plaques that are seen on MR can occur anywhere in the central nervous system. They are often in the regions of the brain that are close to the ventricles and areas that are frequently involved include the optic nerve resulting in um, optic neuritis and blindness, um, which is often unilateral. The brain stem the cerebellum, uh, which can result in problems with coordination and with balance, and in the spinal cord, which can result in either uh, motor or sensory symptoms. The myelin uh, tissue itself in the central nervous system, um, and you remember that myelin in the central nervous system is um, produced by cells that are called oligodendrocytes. So the myelin gets infiltrated with cellular elements of the immune system, including macrophages and microglia. And again, remember that microglia are glial cells that are involved in cellular immunity in the central nervous system. While the axons are generally um, preserved, the loss of myelin means slower conduction time along the nerve. And in some cases, if oligodendrocytes um, remain viable, the axon can become remyelinated and symptoms can improve. And so in a minute, we're going to talk about some of the different forms of multiple sclerosis. Here's that slide. And the most common um, type of multiple sclerosis, the most common presentation of MS, is this form that we call relapsing and remitting. So people have episodes of demyelination in particular areas, again, separated in space, separated in time, and then they get better, and then they relapse again. In, in pure relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, uh, there's no progression between episodes. But over time, typically, people move from 
pure relaxing, remitting MS to secondary progressive MS, um, in which gradually their symptoms progress and they um, be, they they develop progressive disability. A few people. Um, begin their disease with what is known as primary progressive MS, where they have pretty unrelenting progression of symptoms that begins at the beginning of their diagnosis of MS. Um, people may have a progressive remitting course in which even though there are primary, there's primary progression, they have periods of time where they remit and, and have a slower progression or a lack of progression or an improvement of symptoms. But primarily relapsing, remitting, especially at the onset, progressing in most cases to secondary progressive, and then a few cases uh, that start with this primary progressive form. We know that in some people, uh, the symptoms of um, MS start with uh, after an infection, a viral uh, syndrome or another infection. And the symptoms that people develop with MS vary widely. So sometimes um, fatigue is a huge symptom that can be quite extreme and can be disabling, um, making it difficult for people to even get out of bed. People may present with paresthesias or um, areas of numbness, areas of tingling, sensory symptoms. They may develop with motor symptoms, motor weakness um, in the lower extremities, making it difficult to walk, so a gait disorder. About 15% of people with uh, the initial presentation of uh, MS lose vision in an eye. They have an episode of optic neuritis with vision loss. Um, the symptoms usually resolve or remit, lasting days to weeks. And the initial um, episode uh, by definition, because it's a single episode in time and perhaps a single lesion in space, is not diagnosed as um, multiple sclerosis, but rather um, as a uh, isolated episode. But, but it, when you see a young person who develops, say, optic neuritis or who develops uh, paresthesias or gait disorder that then resolve, you might want to keep in mind the possibility of MS if they present later with other symptoms. Um, dizziness and disequilibrium uh, are also common symptoms. So focal weakness, paresthesia, numbness or tingling, sudden loss of vision that's unilateral, um, cranial nerve uh, issues that include double vision from um, loss of weakness of motor function of the extraocular muscles. Um, and then um, urinary symptoms, including incontinence um, and depressive depression and cognitive impairment, which are often later um, symptoms, but can present early. People who with MS who become pregnant um, often uh, feel better for a while and then relapse uh, maybe three months after they deliver the baby. So pregnancy seems to improve the symptoms of MS. And people with MS are often very heat intolerant and feel much worse at higher temperatures. Um, so the sensory disturbances of MS outside of uh, vision, which we'll talk about in the next slide, 
can include um, a, a focal area of numbness or paresthesias in half the body, sometimes loss of position sense, sometimes impaired vibratory sense, although it would not be bilateral, it would generally be unilateral. And there is something called Lermit sign, which um, is a is not specific to MS, but is not unusual in MS, which is a sense of an electrical shock that is precipitated by flexing the head. So flexing the head forward causes this kind of electrical shock uh, sensation down the spine. Aside from optic neuritis and that um, unilateral blindness that is usually transient, people with MS can have double vision, as I mentioned, and also nystagmus. And uh, this is just a picture of or a GIF of nystagmus that I think helps you to get a sense of what it looks like. The motor disturbances of MS include um, several potential patterns. So people may have a single limb weakness. They can have weakness in half of their body, you know, upper and lower extremity. They can have quadriparesis or weakness in all four limbs. Um, they can have spastic paraparesis. And folks who have motor disturbances in MS may have pathologic reflexes in the lower extremity, a positive Babinski test, and in the upper extremity, a positive Hoffman sign. And, and those videos are just demonstrating those two abnormal reflexes. Um, dysarthria is a motor disturbance of speech. And so difficulty speaking um, can occur in MS. So how do we diagnose MS? Well, we basically diagnose it clinically by those um, characteristic symptoms and lesions on MR that are uh, separated in time and in space. But there are a few other things that can be helpful. In MS, not everybody, but many people with MS have something called oligoclonal bands in their CSF. Um, and these are um, um, proteins in the CSF that are normally in plasma and normally not seen in CSF. Um, there are... Um, there is a test using EEG called evoked potentials that may be helpful in making the diagnosis, but labs are only mildly helpful. Um, the, the, the oligoclonal bands in MS are IgG in the CSF that, as I said, is normal in the plasma, but not normally seen in uh, CSF. Generally, the CSF, they'll also be mildly increased protein and possibly more cells than normal. But the most useful tool for making the diagnosis of MS is MR. Um, so imaging using magnetic resonance. And, and most people with MS will have abnormalities on MRI. Um, using contrast with gadolinium allows um, us to identify active lesions. And the uh, finding of lesions that are periventricular, so surrounding the ventricles, um, and have a diameter of greater than 0.6 centimeters are consistent with MS. Here are some periventricular active lesions. Um, here is a spinal cord active lesion. The um, gadolinium um, enhanced MRI, so contra gadolinium contrast using something called weighting, 
allows us to see um, higher um, areas with higher signal intensity uh, that are indicative of um, these MS plaques where there is destruction of myelin. There are um, fairly specific um, diagnostic criteria for MS. It requires two episodes of symptoms or two attacks and two lesions identified on um, MR or two attacks and one lesion and subclinical evidence like the severe uh, fatigue. And these attacks and lesions have to be separated in time and separated in space. Um, to diagnose primary progressive disease, and you remember that's about 10% of the people who initially present with MS, you have to have a one typical brain lesion, two spinal lesions, a year of disease with progression, or two of the three brain lesions, spinal lesions, or the oligoclonal bands in the CSF. I mentioned earlier that, that people who have that initial presenting event potentially uh, of weakness, potentially of optic neuritis, potentially of paresthesias, um, we call that clinically isolated syndrome or CIS. So a single episode that is suspicious for MS, those people are at risk for MS. They may have MS. But because it's a single episode, um, it's un we can't make the diagnosis. It is, uh, in some cases, helpful to treat these people, sometimes with steroids, sometimes with other drugs, um, and to re-image them in six months to see if, we, if, if the initial um, lesion has resolved and to see if potentially there are, have additional lesions have developed. Not everybody with clinically isolated syndrome progresses to having MS. Once the diagnosis is made, it's important to treat because early treatment of MS significantly improves uh, prognosis in terms of disease progression. So people who are treated at the um, diagnosis, at the onset, um, show less progression over time. And the treatment for the acute episodes um, include steroids um, to suppress the cellular immunity that is causing the demyelination. It does not prevent relapses, and we use steroids episodically, not uh, continuously, because the long-term use of steroids, since it doesn't present, prevent relapses and does have significant side effects, um, it, it's not useful. However, episodic treatment, starting with high-dose IV steroids with a PO taper, may speed the recovery of an initial episode and improve the function. Um, when a relapse is not responding to steroids, um, therapeutic plasma exchange has been shown to be helpful. So we basically put the individual on a plasmapheresis pump. We remove blood, uh, anticoagulant, we turn the cells and throw away the plasma and replace that plasma with donor plasma. Um, and obviously there we are not changing the cellular um, uh, aspects of MS, but we are probably removing abnormal antibodies that are participating in the uh, relapse. There are a number of drugs and drug treatment of MS has improved considerably in, in the past decade or so 
um, the original um, drugs that we were using for MS included interferons, both interferon beta 1a and interferon beta 1b, um, which suppress immunity, um, help to maintain the blood-brain barrier and, and improve um, progression. There are a couple of other drugs, Avonex and Rebif. Um, these are all actually uh, drugs that are used um, parenterally in one way or, or another. Some of them are IM, some of them are sub-Q. But in recent years, we've developed some newer drugs that, that modify the course of the disease. One of them is glatiramer acetate or capoxone, capaxone, which seems to decrease the number of relapses. Um, it is also an injectable. It has some side effects that include flushing and dyspnea and chest tightness immediately after administration. Um, but um, several of these drugs that are injectable um, have been quite helpful in, in managing relapses. The newer disease modifying drugs um, are monoclonal antibody therapies. Um, they uh, have been introduced over the last decade or so, maybe two decades. Um, starting with terafluamide, alemtuzumab, um, and, and more recently, uh, cipanamod. I don't know these names. You'll never prescribe these drugs unless you're in neurology. But they have been quite effective in reducing relapses and decreasing progression. On the other hand, they're very costly, and they tend to have rather severe, um, in some cases, adverse uh, effects. So um, there, we have a lot of drugs to choose from. The interferons are used less than they used to be. The um, monoclonal antibody therapies are continuing to be developed. Um, people who treat MS um, have their preferred drug regimens, and often there is sort of this trade-off between uh, convenience, cost, and adverse reactions compared to benefits. So um, there, there are a lot of things that, that need to be looked at in terms of treating an individual. Um, in addition to drugs that change, so there's the, there's the corticosteroids for, for specific relapses. They don't modify the course of the disease. The interferons and all the newer drugs do potentially modify the disease, uh, the course of the disease. Uh, but we also have medicines that we can use to treat um, symptoms. So people with MS can have uh, motor issues that are involve central nervous system motor neurons, so that makes it upper motor neuron disease, meaning they can develop spasticity, and therefore muscle relaxers can be helpful. Baclofen, um, bizanidine, diazepam, and Vampiril. The treatment of optic neuritis is usually that high dose of steroids starting IV methylprednisolone and then uh, on to an oral taper. Um, fatigue may respond to uh, antidepressants. Amantadine works for some people, and then modafinil, which as you know is a drug that has been used for um, people who have um, uh, severe fatigue for other reasons. Um, MS can cause pain, and the pain of MS may respond to gabapentin 
the nerve blocks can be helpful. So involving a pain management anesthesiologist specialist may be very helpful. We try to avoid opioids for obvious reasons uh, relating to potential um, dependence and loss of function. Um, sexual dysfunction responds to the Viagra type drugs. People with tremors may respond to propranolol beta blockers, but also to isoniazid, I don't know why, and primidone. And there's a drug called delfapridine, delfampridine, that has been helpful in improving the gait of people with MS who have gait uh, disorders. So these are just examples of drugs that are used. Other muscle relaxers may be used. Other steroids may be used. Um, other beta blockers, you know, depending on the symptom and the patient again. The, the progression of MS, the prognosis of MS, is extremely variable. So as I said, about half of people with MS end up needing some uh, help with gait at 15 years, about 50% of people have some disability in some area um, 10 years after diagnosis. Depression is both caused by the disease and by having the disease. And so it's really important when you're caring for people with a disease like MS to screen for depression and to screen for suicidal um, thinking and to treat before um, the possibility of um, suicide occurs. Um, there is some evidence that women who are under 40 at the age of diagnosis who present initially with sensory symptoms have a better outcome. So that's what will that will leave MS there and we'll move on to cerebral palsy. Um, cerebral palsy is really probably not a single thing. It's a group of conditions that vary tremendously, but that all involve some permanent motor dysfunction that starts around birth and that may affect muscle tone, muscle strength, posture, and movement. Um, I actually changed this slide to include the definition from up to date because I thought that it was a helpful way of thinking about this group of problems that we define as cerebral palsy. So people with cerebral palsy have to have motor dysfunction and it has to be permanent motor dysfunction. Um, and it has to start around birth, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it may be accompanied by other disabilities. Um, some people with cerebral palsy have um, developmental delay, uh, intellectual um, and cognition problems. They may have problems with behavior. They may have problems with sensation, and they may have an associated seizure disorder. So about two out of a thousand children born end up not being diagnosed with cerebral palsy, not diagnosed at birth, generally diagnosed later, but two to four per thousand live births um, end up with cerebral palsy. And here's your osmosis video. Here, sorry, let's go on. So, we define cerebral palsy to some degree according to the timing uh, of when the damage occurs. And the majority of cases of cerebral palsy, the damage occurs in the prenatal period. Um, and, and there are a number of potential uh, prenatal causes of CP, including some fairly rare genetic causes and a number of potential environmental causes. So prenatal majority of cases, 
but there can also be perinatal or postnatal causes of cerebral palsy. Among the prenatal causes of cerebral palsy are intrauterine bleeding. So, so um, pregnancies that are complicated by placenta previa um, and by other potential causes of, of intrauterine bleeding. There are genetic factors. There are a number of infections that, as you know, can cause prenatal damage, including rubella and cytomegalovirus and toxoplasmosis. There are environmental causes. So um, anything that results in uh, hypoxia to the fetus, which might include hypoxia of the mother, um, radiation exposure and, and some medications, um, along with other potential maternal characteristics and diseases um, that the baby is exposed to during prenatal, the prenatal period. And those maternal characteristics include advanced maternal age, um, difficulty with conception and a history of miscarriages, um, multiple births, um, those babies have a higher incidence of CP. Mom smoking or drug and alcohol use can contribute. Um, people with lower socioeconomic status, the babies have a higher risk of cerebral palsy, RH disease, thyroid disease, and mercury exposure. Um, all of these things can lead to cerebral palsy that begins in that prenatal period. The, the perinatal uh, potential causes of CP include preeclampsia, um, so, you know, around birth mom's uh, preeclampsia, hypertension, and, and the other things that go along with that can result in damage to the baby's nervous system. Complications during labor and delivery that cause hypoxia to the baby that can include things like uh, cord prolapse, short cords, you know, uh, cord complications, and then inappropriate birth position um, and like breech births resulting in complicated labor and delivery. And then sepsis, um, infection uh, of the central nervous system, so group uh, B strep, for instance, which is something I know that you've heard about, and then babies who are premature or who are small for gestational age. And then after birth in the early infancy period, uh, meningitis or encephalitis, hemorrhage, um, traumatic brain injury, exposure to toxins, hyperbilirubinemia, which occurs with some babies, hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, certain inherited metabolic disorders, and seizure disorders all can result in the central nervous system damage that ends up causing cerebral palsy, resulting in cerebral palsy. In about a quarter of patients, no cause can be identified. Bad luck. Um, this is just some of the things that we see. You know, this is not a diagnosis that's generally made immediately. Um, it takes a while to see the um, motor manifestations of the central nervous system damage that, that causes CP. But some of the things that we start to see as babies start to become more mobile are that um, they sit with their legs rotated and their knees flexed, so this W sitting. That's something that should kind of trigger uh, thinking about whether motor development is normally normal. Babies who scoot on their bottom instead of crawling and then early walking um, on tiptoe is abnormal. I want to talk about some of the types of cerebral palsy. So in 
different um, countries, some of these definitions are a little bit different, but the essential types of cerebral palsy are spastic, dyskinetic, and ataxic, okay? And then there's combined or mixed damage. So spastic palsy, the damage is in the motor cortex. The impairments are typically hemiplegia, diplegia, or quadriplegia, and those definitions are at the bottom. Hemiplegia means one side of the body is affected, usually the arm more than the leg. Diplegia means use two limbs are affected and it's usually both legs. And quadriplegia means all four limbs are affected and usually in quadriplegia, the legs are more affected than the arms, unlike in hemiplegia, okay? It's the most common type of cerebral palsy. It may be localized or it may affect all extremities. Um, these folks um, have their legs tend to scissor. They ha it's an upper motor um, disease, so they are spastic. The muscles don't have the um, uh, input from um, potential from lower motor neurons that are somewhat inhibitory, so they're hypertonic. Um, they, they, they're more uh, contracted than normal. They can't relax. Um, in dyskinetic palsy, there are abnormal movements with uh, that are not controllable. Um, it, it generally, these kids have damage to the basal ganglia and have quadriplegia um, and are pretty sick. They have trouble eating, uh, feeding, um, they have these uncontrolled abnormal movements. Um, in ataxic palsy, the damage is in the cerebellum. Um, they often have real problems with uh, balance, with depth perception. They may have tremors. They may have quadriplegia. Spastic palsy is common. Ataxic palsy is quite rare. And then some kids have damage to more than one area, um, usually a combination of spastic and dyskinetic palsy, so uh, damage to the motor cortex and the basal ganglia. With spastic cerebral palsy, there can also be a single limb affected, which would be monoplegia. And then we talk about hemiplegia, paraplegia, and quadriplegia. Um, and those are definitions I think you need to memorize. Um, they're in the notes. Here are some illustrations of hemiplegia where the limbs on one side are affected. So you'll see um, some contractures and spasticity in the upper and lower extremity. Um, those, um, that spasticity it, uh, will result in tiptoe walking, um, a hand bent, uh, difficulty using the arm on the side that's affected, with the other side being normal or, or complete or close to normal. Um, one thing that happens as, as the children grow is that um, the effect of, of the spastic muscles is that the bone um, development may be abnormal and they may end up with shorter limbs on the affected side. In diplegia or paraplegia, it's usually the legs that are primarily affected with the upper body being pretty normal. Um, these kids often need... Um, crutches to walk, um, but, and they often become very uh, strong in their upper extremity. They may, because of the lack of inhibition they, and, and spasticity, they often develop 
uh, muscle contractures of their ankles and feet that keep them from being able to walk completely flat. Kids with quadriplegia um, also both upper and lower extremities uh, are affected. They often never are able to walk because they don't have the, they tend to have really severe brain damage. Um, you often see the knees kind of knocking together with contractures of the both upper and lower extremities. And then kids with spastic quadriplegia have this scissors position of their lower limbs. Um, so the legs stiffen when you, when you try to stand them. Um, a few, uh, with damage to the cerebellum, um, you can have this ataxic form of cerebral palsy, uh, with poor balance, um, a, a unusual gait, a lot of falling and stumbling and an inability to walk in a straight line. We talked about that as being a rarer form of cerebral palsy, the dyskinetic, uh, or athetoid form of cerebral palsy is the one where people have difficulty with feeding themselves. Um, they have these abnormal involuntary movements. Hypotonic cerebral palsy is not currently listed as one of the types, but there are a few kids with cerebral palsy who just have generalized flaccid weakness as opposed to spasticity. And then again, there are kids with mixed um, characteristics, usually a combination of spastic and actually dyskinetic, not ataxic, but it could be spastic and ataxic. I'm sorry, I should have fixed that slide. This I, I just added to kind of give you a little decision tree. Um, for the subtypes of um, cerebral palsy. So here you see spastic, dyskinetic, and ataxic. Um, again, understanding that occasionally there are mixed types um, and that, that um, in spastic, you can have unilateral or bilateral involvement. And spasticity is persistent increased muscle tone. Okay. So during early infancy, babies with unusually stiff or floppy postures, um, who have poor head control, who have difficulty feeding, who are irritable or lethargic, these are things to look for as a possible sign of cerebral palsy. Kids with cerebral palsy often have um, abnormal primitive reflexes. So there are certain reflexes like the Moro reflex, which is a startle reflex, um, that are normal in very early infancy, but resolve with time and um, persistence of those reflexes uh, may be an indication of the central nervous system damage associated with cerebral palsy. Kids with cerebral palsy often have associated symptoms that can include perceptual problems like trouble with hearing and vision, um, difficulty integrating sensory information, feeding problems, and failure to thrive, which means failure to gain weight and grow appropriately, problems with their behavior and emotions, problems with communicating, um, it's not at all unusual for them to have bladder and bowel control problems, um, to have learning disabilities and intellectual disabilities. And as I mentioned, seizure disorders may be um, associated with cerebral palsy. In addition, a lot of kids with cerebral palsy have pain and pain clearly affects quality of life and is something that needs to be addressed. Um, also, difficulty with sleep and sleep disorders are commonly associated with cerebral palsy.
what do we see in terms of physical exam? Well, it depends on the cause and it depends on the type. So we might see spasticity and hyperreflexia. We might see um, involuntary movements, lack of coordination, ataxia. Um, there are other effects of some of the um, uh, infectious causes of cerebral palsy. So folks who, who had um, kids who were exposed to maternal um, CMV or rubella during prenatal life may have cataracts, may have retinal uh, abnormalities, and may have cardiac defects. To make the diagnosis of cerebral palsy, uh, probably the first and most important thing is that the disorder is static. It is not progressive. Um, it, the, the weakness, the spasticity doesn't get worse over time. It doesn't extend from, you know, one side to the other side or from one limb to more than one limb. Um, and in most cases, the diagnosis can be made uh, as the baby's motor development is abnormal in the probably second year of life. But there are kids in whom it takes a little bit longer. In some previous slides, it said the diagnosis couldn't be made before the age of three. But I don't think that's any longer thought to be the case. Um, characteristic. Um, issues that are identified during normal um, visits to the pediatrician and then sometimes further uh, developmental evaluations around uh, problems with, with uh, motor development and muscle tone and posture along with these associated symptoms like um, lack of normal uh, intellectual development um, and speech and problems like seizure disorders uh, will, will give us um, the suspicion. Um, there are criteria that are called the Levine criteria. They are also called the poster criteria because they spell the word poster. So either abnormal posture or abnormal movement um, along with oropharyngeal problems, trouble with swallowing and, and tongue um, movements, strabismus, which is, you know, uh, uh, inability to point the eyes in the same direction, muscle tone, which could be um, both hyper or increased tone spasticity or hypo which is decreased tone flaccidity. And then these persistent primitive reflexes, which are under E for evolutional maldevelopment, um, and then R for increased deep tendon reflexes or persistent Babinski reflex. So four out of six of the poster criteria or the Levine criteria strongly suggests CP. MRI can be very helpful in identifying the actual um, physical uh, causes of the symptoms that we see. In addition, because of the prevalence of seizure disorders, EEGs can be very helpful. In some cases, genetic testing or testing for um, these um, metabolic uh, disorders that may participate in the development of cerebral palsy can be helpful. Let me come back to this is a static disorder. It is not a progressive disorder. And in this slide from... Uh, it's a European collaborative group on the diagnosis of um, cerebral palsy, but I thought even though it's the European group, it was quite helpful. And just sort of look at this um, to help for making this diagnosis. If the child has a disorder of movement or of posture that is of central origin, 
yeah, it might be cerebral palsy. Okay, it has to be a disorder of movement or posture of central origin. That's primary in making a diagnosis. If the disorder is not of motor function, it excludes CP. If the disorder is progressive, if they are losing previously acquired abilities, it is um, it excludes cerebral palsy. Okay, so to include, it has to be a disorder of motor function of central origin, okay? Now, um, in a progressive disorder, it excludes. A non-progressive disorder, um, if the child was um, four when assessed, um, we... Um, can check whether the child has a syndrome or brain anomaly or a chromosomal genetic abnormality. Okay. Um, if the child is, it's ruled, if the child dies before the age of two, we rule out CP. Okay. So um, we can move along generalized hypotonia with ataxia, we make that diagnosis of ataxic CP. In most cases, it's hypertonia um, and spasticity. So how do we treat cerebral palsy? Well, it's complicated and it involves many disciplines, and this is only a little bit of what it involves. But th the goal is to improve function and to give the kid the maximal um, potential abilities uh, functionally. So physical therapy and occupational therapy are crucial, um, along with, in many cases, speech therapy, in many cases, orthopedic involvement with um, surgeries often being helpful, sometimes into adulthood, to correct deformities, to improve contractures. Um, orthotics and mobility um, devices can be extremely important in the care. Neurologists are often involved, obviously pediatricians, which it doesn't even mention. Um, and then social work and social support, mental health support for the child, um, especially in adolescence, but also for the family. So um, medicine is a small, a small part of the treatment of cerebral palsy, but Botox injections um, to improve spasticity can be helpful. Um, in some kids with CP. Um, in some cases, oral muscle relaxers like baclofen. Um, certainly anti-seizure medications when there are associated seizure disorders. There are some kids who benefit from intrathecal baclofen. Baclofen as a drug doesn't have great oral bioavailability, so a little bit of baclofen directed um, to the uh, nerve roots through an intrathecal pump can be um, helpful, but uh, we don't want to take baclofen away suddenly because there is actually a withdrawal from baclofen. Um, kids who are ambulatory at the age of 12 have a very good prognosis for uh, a fairly normal adulthood. Um, some children with cerebral palsy die at a young age from things like aspiration and pneumonia and other infections um, that are more common because of the complications of their cerebral palsy. So that's what we're going to talk 
uh, have to say about cerebral palsy. But I think remembering the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to improve function. Um, that's our goal with cerebral palsy treatment. The next disease I want to talk about is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, which is also called motor neuron disease, particularly in the UK, although I've heard it called motor neuron disease at some points in the US. This is a progressive um, disorder of both the central and peripheral nervous system. So it is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder. It falls in with those other progressive neurodegenerative disorders that we talked about, like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. However, it does not affect only the central nervous system. It affects upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons and primarily motor neurons, which is why it's called motor neuron disease. There are familial cases, so there are hereditary cases, but most cases of ALS are sporadic. Um, the incidence of ALS rises with age it is more common in men up until the 70s when the uh, incidence becomes about the same between men and women. Um, we don't know any risk factors outside of those families in which there's a familial um, cause and age. Um, we do know that in some cases it's associated with frontotemporal dementia and that it is related to abnormal protein deposition. So it has similar molecular pathways to frontotemporal dementia. Um, and there is neuron loss um, with loss of large myelinated nerves, neuron death. And gliosis is, is sort of an increase in glial cells with loss of neurons, replacement by neurons with glial cells. As I said, it is relentlessly progressive. And so from um, the time of diagnosis by uh, Five years after diagnosis, only about 20% of people with ALS are still living. And that is particularly true with people whose um, symptoms start um, centrally and, um, you know, upper motor neurons involving um, brain stem. People whose... Um, onset is more lower motor neurons have a somewhat better course, but still it's extremely progressive and, and very few, very few folks with ALS live more than uh, 10 years. Uh, you know, it happens, it's very unusual. People with ALS often present with weakness they often have evidence of denervation, lower motor neuron disease with atrophy and fasciculation. So these links take you to movies. Um, I will see if, I don't think this will work. Let me check. Um, the movies, yeah, that I don't think you'll be able to see that. The movies are on... Um, uh, up to date, but you can go back and look at them um, when you get a chance. Um, lower motor neuron disease, as I said, um, fasciculations, atrophy, and flaccidity, decreased tone and decreased reflexes. Now remember that ALS affects both upper and lower motor neurons, so it, other uh, 
things that you may see, depending on which neurons are affected, include increased tone or spasticity and increased reflexes. Um, if you have weak and wasted muscles, but reflexes remain uh, at, at, uh, elicitable at any degree, that suggests upper motor neuron disease. And there are some pathologic reflexes, things like the Babinski, the Hoffman sign, which is that finger flicking sign, um, a jaw jerk, which is a movement of the jaw muscles when the chin is tapped. Um, and then some people with upper motor neuron disease get something called pseudobulbar affect. So they have inappropriate laughing or crying or kind of crazy yawning. There are criteria for the diagnosis of ALS. They are called the Gold Coast Diagnostic Criteria, and here they are. So someone who presents with progressive upper and lower motor neuron symptoms and signs in one limb or body segment, or progressive lower motor neuron symptoms and signs in at least two body segments. So upper and lower in one body segment, lower in two body segments. So that's the or. And an absence of something else to explain it. So absence of uh, electrophysiologic neuroimaging or pathology evidence of other diseases that could explain the lower or upper motor neuron degeneration. So that's the Gold Coast diagnostic criteria for ALS. Treatment of ALS is mostly symptomatic and includes both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies. So it's important, again, to take a multidisciplinary approach. These folks often, I mean, certainly need neurology, but they may need pulmonology because ultimately they will have difficulty breathing, which might require respiratory therapy, might require ventilation. Um, they generally need physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, they may need speech therapy, uh, especially around swallowing issues. They often need uh, help uh, with depression and mood disorders, so psychiatry. Um, because of the relentless nature of the disease, um, if palliative care specialists are available as they reach um, end-of-life issues, palliative care can be helpful, and social work is often very important for helping to coordinate care, um, and family support is important. There is a lot of research, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, um, going on in, in efforts to both identify things to prevent uh, progression um, and to identify the, the causes. And I think that this is a video, this is a two-minute neuroscience video. There wasn't a good osmosis video about ALS. This is very short but talks about um, ALS pathology and uh, signs and symptoms. The next thing I wanna talk about is restless leg syndrome. So this is a interesting and, and relatively common um, neuromuscular problem where people have a sensation, usually in their legs, um, that makes them want to move and the movement may relieve the sensation. So the sensation is often described as crawling or tingling or discomfort, itching that's deep. Um, it, they, they need to move, the movement may relieve the sensation. It clearly interferes with sleep. The, these people have, uh, they tend to notice this more when things are quiet and they have a lot of difficulty resting. There is an association with um, low iron stores and low ferritin, but not particularly with anemia. 
and we don't know what causes it. There are some families in which it's more common, so there might be some genetic causes. There have been some links with Parkinson's disease. Remember, I talked about that uh, akathisia, that discomfort in Parkinson's disease that, that requires movement. People who are pregnant uh, sometimes develop restless leg syndrome, which then resolves um, after the pregnancy resolves. I said there's not a big association with anemia, but since there is an association with low iron stores, some people with iron deficiency anemia have restless leg syndrome, which may resolve when the iron stores are uh, uh, improved. People with uremia or kidney failure, some patients with diabetes have restless leg syndrome. So when you see somebody complaining of these symptoms, you should check serum ferritin levels and iron stores. Do a good review of their medication history, of their family history. Um, and the treatment depends on the severity of the symptoms. Um, some people don't require um, treatment. We know that some people really benefit from gabapentin or pregabalin. I'm not sure pregabalin is spelled right there. I'll check on that. Some dopaminergic drugs, dopamine agonists, improve these symptoms, um, but they can cause... Um, behavior issues in people who have impulse control problems. Uh, so levodopa is also a dopamine agonist. And occasionally opiates are helpful in suppressing the sensation and the movement, particularly at nighttime. The next neuromuscular disease that I want to talk about, we're getting close to the end here, is a condition that I think we brushed on briefly during physiology called myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is a, an autoimmune disorder in which people are making antibodies that block the nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. So you remember that motor nerves terminating at muscle at the neuromuscular junction use acetylcholine, that the muscle has uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And when there are antibodies, autoantibodies to those receptors, the acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction is unable to activate the muscle. Um, this is a disorder that occurs much more commonly in women than in men. Um, and it affects some muscles more than other muscles. And typically, um, it's more the muscles around the head. So jaw muscles, facial muscles, the muscles of the eyelids, muscles of the, of the throat um, and of the larynx, and occasionally respiratory muscles and limb muscles. Um, and sometimes these folks don't become um, symptomatic until something else happens. They, they develop another disease or an acute illness, which sort of triggers um, worsening of their weakness. They, because of the muscles that I said are often involved, the muscles of the head and face, they will often have eyelid drooping, which is frequently not symmetric. They may have double vision if the extraocular motor muscles are involved. They can develop dysarthria or difficulty with speech, you know, speech that is kind of muddy sounding because they can't articulate correctly. They may have trouble with chewing, and that chewing um, that after a few chews, they get really tired and weak and have trouble uh, chewing their food. And in the case of people whose diaphragm is affected, they may have trouble breathing. One of the things about myasthenia gravis that's interesting is that the symptoms tend to vary 
Um, so during the course of the day, they tend to worsen. And the more fatigued somebody is generally, the more fatigued those affected muscles become. And folks with myasthenia do not have um, abnormalities of sensation. It is motor um, symptoms. And they, it does not include the pupillary responses. So you see somebody with droopy eyelids, but normal pupillary responses. Um, you will often see that people improve after rest and um, get worse after uh, repeated use of the muscles. So like I said, chewing, you know, they may start out strong and then they kind of get to where they can't finish chewing. The diagnosis is made by giving this drug called edrophonium or tensilon, and it causes immediate, immediate improvement that lasts for a few minutes and then goes away. This is a test done in a neurologist's office. Um, when it is done, atropine has to be available in case some, somebody gets side effects. Um, so uh, that's the diagnosis. In some cases, myasthenia gravis is accompanied by a tumor of the thymus gland called a thymoma um, and removal of the um, thymus gland or of the tumor may improve symptoms considerably. Um, we check uh, for serum and acetylcholine antibodies and some of these folks also have anti muscle specific kinase antibodies. Um, the treatment um, is drugs that improve symptoms. Uh, they don't cure the disease. If there's a thymoma, taking out the thymus may lead to remission. People with myasthenia gravis are often extremely sensitive to a large number of drugs. Um, they are often advised to carry a list of those drugs with them so that they can avoid um, both uh, over-the-counter and especially prescription drugs that might exacerbate their symptoms. Um, folks with myasthenia may respond to intravenous immunoglobulin. Um, and in the case of people with myasthenia that is severe and affecting their breathing, um, plasma exchange um, may be helpful. Also in people with myasthenia who are going under anesthesia or having symptoms, um, we put them on a plasmapheresis machine, like I said, take out their blood, anticoagulate it, return their cells, discard their plasma, and give them donor uh, plasma. Um, so plasmapheresis and IVIG uh, work, and they work quickly. They're very effective, but they need to be repeated if they're going to keep working. And they, so they are used as bridges to other therapies. Um, and those therapies may include um, steroids, may include things like pyridostigmine, um, drugs for um, immune suppression like azathioprine and um, eculizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody. So, Many people with myasthenia gravis, it's annoying and um, rarely serious. But when um, it involves the respiratory muscles, it can lead to death. So occasionally people with myasthenia develop a crisis in which their uh, respiratory muscles, their, their diaphragms become so weak that they need ventilatory support. They need to be put on a, on a ventilation. Um, things like infections and um, uh, occasionally uh, medication uh, exposures, drugs, 
to trigger myasthenia gravis. So those folks need to be put intubated, put on a tube, put on a ventilator, and then treated with something like IVIG and or plasmapheresis. And here we have a video. Now, there is something that resembles myasthenia gravis. And I think we talked about this briefly during physiology as well. And it is called Lambert-Eaton syndrome or myasthenic syndrome. And it's typically associated with an underlying uh, condition. Um, these are folks who have um, antibodies against um, voltage-gated calcium channels. And it is often associated with small cell lung tumors. Um, so it is similar in some ways to the symptoms of myasthenia, and it has some differences. Um, it tends to spare the extraocular mus muscles. So, so people will have the lid drooping, but they won't have the diplopia. Um, and unlike myasthenia, folks with Lambert-Eaton syndrome improve with repeated contraction of the same muscle as opposed to tiring. Um, in addition to the underlying, potential underlying uh, small cell lung cancer. Uh, it can be associated with other autoimmune diseases, um, with vitamin B12 deficiency that causes pernicious anemia. And in some cases, we, it, there is no association. It's its own disease. So here I am repeating that the extraocular muscles are spared and that the strength increases when the muscle contraction is held. And here we have some comparisons between myasthenia and Lambert-Eaton syndrome. So the antibodies are different, the associations are different, the weakness is different, um, in myasthenia, deep tendon reflexes are normal, whereas in Lambert-Eaton syndrome, the deep tendon reflexes in the affected muscle groups are decreased. Um, and I think uh, most importantly, the um, with repeated stim nerve stimulation or prolonged exercise, people with myasthenia gravis get weaker and people with Lambert-Eaton syndrome get stronger. So when you suspect Lambert-Eaton syndrome clinically, so it's, di it's a diagnosis made by history and physical exam, um, you look for a cause, and that cause could be a small cell lung cancer it could be vitamin B12 deficiency with pernicious anemia. You treat the cancer um, as a bridge, uh, plasma phoresis, plasma exchange, and IVIG can be helpful just as they are with myasthenia. And steroids are sometimes helpful for during times of exacerbation. So that's our lecture for today and I hope it was helpful.